Welcome back to Father Offspring Interviews, episode four. Um, as always, we're loving all of your questions and your engagement, so keep it coming. And we're going to jump right into today's content, if you are already. Love it. Okay. Um, we're going to start out with a question from Shelly from California, who asks, um, we're getting better and better at treating neuropsychiatric disorders, can offer help to more and more people, but what if someone doesn't want to be cured? Um, how do we avoid going down a slippery bioethics slope if we eliminate consenting laws? Well, we're going down a slippery bioethics slope. No way out of it. There, there's like two slam dunk extremes. Using psychiatry as a tool of political repression and various dictators and throwing people and psychiatric hospitals. So yeah, that's obviously bad. Um, other extreme, you get somebody who is floridly psychotic, living on the street, can't feed themselves, can't, they're going to freeze to death tonight, midwinter or whatever, and they're refusing treatment. And I am massively unknowledgeable about what the laws are with that, but that's someone who clearly needs help. And where I think most people would agree, they're not in a position to say, no, you're Satan's messenger or whatever. In between, though, is this incredibly messy world of uh, who gets to decide what's normal? Who gets to decide what counts as a psychiatric disorder, as a psychological one, as a quirk, as a, as a whatever, as an idiosyncrasy? And all that's clear is there's enormous cross-cultural differences like there's stuff I do here that without question would count as mentally ill when I'm in East Africa. Um, okay. And, you know, all sorts of circumstances where there's microcultures as to what's considered the norm. It's incredibly difficult. I mean, under the best of circumstances, even what counts as being physically healthy is a little bit subjective. And so what counts as being mentally healthy? I mean, one of the things we should be very on guard against is the notion that being healthy means that you're sick in the same ways that everybody else is. So this is a really tough question. Okay, a lot of people have been asking about this. So um, maybe you can just talk a little bit about like how you developed your sort of speaking lecturing style. Like were there specific people whose styles like you think you were influenced by? And like, when did you first start lecturing formally? those sorts of things? Uh, well, let's see. It was while I was doing my field work in East Africa. Every Sunday morning, I would preach to the baboons, and they have short attention spans, so that forced me to get a little bit better. Um, I don't actually have terribly good, thorough training in science, um, so I've got a lot of holes. Um, so I think I've retained a good instinct for exactly when I would start getting confused in a lecture and thus need a break or an anecdote or a something. Um, but that's kind of how this has evolved. And uh, I don't know, it's fun to teach. All right, our next question is, um, you've spoken about fractals slash bifurcating systems in your lectures. Um, it seems to be present from the smallest to the largest systems. Um, besides the Feigenbaum constant, are there any other interesting characteristics to make note of? Whoa, okay, so we're, we're getting in the, in the high grass, low grass here on this one. Feigenbaum, bifurcating systems. Okay, utterly great aspect of fractal systems. You got like a trunk of a tree, we got it here, and it goes a certain distance and then it splits, it bifurcates. And then it splits there again and splits there again in a whole series. And these repeated bifurcations, that's a motif in all sorts of living systems. Trees branching, blood vessels descending from your heart branching, pulmonary stuff branching, Neurons look under a microscope and look at its main axon, which then bifurcates and bifurcates and bifurcates, and, and stuff in the physical world also, like rivers bifurcate to form uh, river deltas. So amid that sort of uh, ubiquity at all these different scales and fractalness and stuff, um, Feigenbaum, this uh, mathematician came up with what turns out to be a constant, a ratio of how long something goes before it bifurcates 
and before it bifurcates again and bifurcates again. It's this ratio. And his Feigenbaum, it's a constant. Um, Feigenbaum constant is 4.669 and an infinite number of digits after that. So if you're sick of memorizing pi, you could memorize that. So are there any interesting elaborations on it? And the answer is yes, reality. Because like a lot of this stuff with fractal geometry and chaotic systems and things like that, they're, they're idealized, they're formalized, and reality comes in so that the real world doesn't quite match that. And a great example of that is in the pulmonary system, you got your trachea, that's right, not esophagus, your trachea, and then it splits and splits and bifurcates and all of that. And if you've grown up at high altitude, less oxygen, there's a shift in the bifurcation ratio in the lungs. So they bifurcate more so that you've got a bushier sort of bush of alveoli doing oxygen exchange at the end. Um, in other words, you know, you know, platonic bifurcating reality and the fact that these are typically with living systems. So that accommodates reality. All right, our next question um, asked by Victoria from Romania slash Germany is, um, do you play the piano? How did you get started? How long have you been doing it? Um, okay, well, I started playing piano when I was four because I was totally bored and wanted to learn how to read. And my mother decided I would be even more bored at school. So they started me on piano. I've got the world's worst fingers for playing piano. They're short and stubby. So I specialized in very percussive 20th century music, and which like is howlingly dissonant. So that's okay. Um, I was pretty serious through high school and college. I like got some money playing piano for ballet schools, things like that. Once I started going to Africa, um, it became kind of impractical that I was away so much of each year that I couldn't do that. So it lay dormant until your mother Actually, okay, let me break the fourth wall here. Who am I talking to? Am I talking to you or am I talking to the two and a half people watching this? As such, am I referring to your mother, my wife, mom, mommy, Lisa, Dr. Cher, Dr. Cher Sapolsky? Can we, can we settle on a convention here? Go ahead and talk to me. <laughs> okay, so all of that was very mothballed piano until... Mommy got burned out on being a neuropsychologist and started directing musical theater, and I wound up being her rehearsal pianist, as you well know, and it's been an agonizing sort of challenge to deal with how bad I've rusted away into being over the decades um, with trying to get through any given piece of music. Okay, for our final question for this episode, um, Camilo from Colombia asks, um, anterior cingulate cortex. Why is it so cool? Oh, you have to ask? Yes, it's incredibly cool. It's one of the best parts of the brain. It's up in the cortex there by the anterior cingulate. Okay, initially it looks really boring. You cut your finger and parts of your brainstem that say, ouch, are getting activated, and parts that say that was my finger and not my toe, and parts that say that was a sharp pain and not an abrasive pain and all of that. And then the anterior cingulate also activates. Okay, so it's got something to do with it. Now we look at two different circumstances. Sit you down and they're going to poke your finger with a pin again, but they smear like purple yogurt all over your finger and say, this is this incredibly new, powerful topical anesthetic that you're going to feel nothing there at all while we smear this on. And now we poke your finger and your brainstem is not fooled for a second. It's outro-meter goes off and says my finger and that was sharp and all of that but your anterior cingulate doesn't activate. It's falling for the placebo effect. Is the anterior cingulate telling you about pain, how much, where, all that? No, it's giving you an interpretation of it. So now let's flip that the other way. Now you're sitting there and uh, you're 
going through one of the most fiendishly clever experiments ever. You sit the person down and there's a screen with three X's and you are this X and there's two supposed people in the next room but they're actually computers with X's also and you get to toss a ball, just play catch back and forth with the ball and that's going along there just fine and you're in a brain scanner and suddenly middle school nightmare dork all over again, they stop throwing the ball to you. You get excluded, socially excluded, and the anterior cingulate activates. It's not just about the pain, it's the pain of social exclusion. It's also about a different type of pain. Now, nobody's excluding you or poking your finger. You're lying in the uh, brain scanner, and they take the finger of your loved one and poke it. And your brainometer stuff has nothing to say, but your anterior cingulate activates. It's about empathy as well. So we've got two different themes here. Is the anterior cingulate about psychic pain? Or is it about empathic pain? And we get kind of a convergence there in a very interesting domain. What do you see in people with major clinical depression? What most studies report is elevated activity per unit space of anterior cingulate, elevated activity, depression as psychic pain, depression as empathically feeling the pains of the world, all of that. So totally cool part of the brain and something maybe you can get into at some point when you're looking at somebody's finger being poked, your anterior cingulate doesn't activate the same for everyone. It depends whose finger it is and if they count as an us or a them. Well, I think what we can conclude is that it is objectively cool indeed. Okay, well, that that's it for this episode. Um, keep submitting your questions at the forum found in the Instagram story highlight in bio or the YouTube video description. See you next episode. Um, I'm Offspring Shares Zapolsky, and thank you for your continued support of science and the beard. And remember, loose lips sink ships.